RugbyRenegade.com, the number one online strength and conditioning program for rugby. Are you ready to get bigger, stronger, fitter, and faster and dominate your opposition? Welcome to the Rugby Renegade Podcast, where we build machines. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the Rugby Renegade podcast. My name's Jamie Bain and today I interview Tim Gabbett, who is a sports scientist who's a specialist in training load monitoring in rugby as well as other sports. Um, Tim's at the forefront of what he does um, and he's got a great knack of making things uh, a lot more understandable for you know the lay person, for explaining to players and coaches. He's got some really good analogies. Um, and I'm sure you get a huge amount of information and, and practical tips that you can use even if you don't have access to training monitoring tools such as GPS and heart rate. Um, so have a listen uh, and I'm sure you'll get some some good training ideas. Hi Tim, welcome to the Rugby Running Aid podcast. Uh, you know, thanks for, for taking your time to, to do this. Oh, thanks very much for having me on, Jamie. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have someone who, who you know really is sort of at, at the forefront of um, you know research in rugby, um, and I've been looking forward to sort of picking your brains on everything rugby like GPS and, and research. Uh, but why don't we start by um, sort of telling our listeners a bit, little bit about yourself, how you got into what you're currently doing, and, and some of the teams you've worked with. Mm. Um, look, I've been involved with with uh, teams for essentially my whole life. I um, I've been involved with with sport for a long time, but um, I, I followed followed my old man around with um, with the sporting teams he was working with, and he he was involved with rugby league and and football teams, and where where he, wherever he went when he was training those those players, I'd be I'd go with him. Um, so my my early background was very much in in strength and conditioning, and and. Starting, starting with with my early um, strength and conditioning coaching, you you have to be a bit of a, a jack of all trades. So you you end up um, at some at at those early levels, at the lower levels that I was working at initially. You you do strength and conditioning, but then you also do a bit of monitoring. You end up looking after a few injuries, and you you fill up water bottles. You you end up um, you, you do a whole heap of different different jobs because they don't. They don't have skilled practitioners in every different role. Um, as as time has gone on, um, that that role that I performed in strength and conditioning has probably merged more into strength and conditioning and and applied sports science. So so taking some of the monitoring tools that we use on a day to day basis and and using those some of that technology, some of it expensive, expensive, some of it not so expensive, and using that to to inform the the strength and conditioning that we do, um, so I'm, I'm at a point now where <clears throat> I work I work day to day in the field with with players and coaches, um, but um, there's not a there's not a big separation between what I do in a um, an applied servicing type role um, and a research type role. Um, some people see them as two separate entities, research and servicing, but but I. I sort of try and marry those up um, as closely as possible. Yeah, and that's great. And sometimes I think that's what's kind of missing. You, like you say, you get the separate, you know, lab-based researchers, and then you get the practitioners. But you're actually um, studying stuff that's helping the actual practitioners, so they can apply it. So that's great. Um, why don't we start some uh, kind of hot topic and, and stuff that you've been talking a lot recently? Um, I was lucky enough to see you talk in, in Coventry at the Perform Better conference uh, is the the training and injury prevention paradox um, and I think it's train harder and smarter is kind of your the slogan you've taken that what could you discuss that a bit yeah look when when uh, when training monitoring sort of first came came out I think a lot of people um, went down the path of we're, we're not training harder we're training smarter um, but what we what we've we've done is we've we've worked with athletes and, and coaches in the field day in day out as I, as I said but what we've also tried to do is look inside that data a little bit more and um, and have a, a fair bit of scientific rigor behind the work that we do um, and and part of that is is publishing the work we do we don't have to publish it but um, that that's that's one of the things that we've tried to do is is add to the body of knowledge in that area and um, consistently what we've seen in, in recent times is that it's, it's not 
when you back players away from load that you get fewer injuries. What we're actually seeing is that you can actually train harder and the paradox is that when you train harder, you get fewer injuries, which is um, completely against what most of us think should be the case. So we've sort of changed our thinking a little bit to that we should be training smarter and harder. Um, and there's a whole heap of reasons for, for those sort of findings. Um, we're seeing that a lot of players are, are breaking down not ne- they break down when we spike their training loads, so when we ask them to do things that they're not prepared for. So when we ask them to do things in this week or in this session, that's much greater than, than what they've been prepared for over a longer period of time. Um, but we're also seeing that they break down at, at really low training loads as well. So when we back them away from, from training, thinking that we're doing them a favour, we're wrapping them in cotton wool trying to prevent injury, we actually set them up to break because they're not prepared to handle the demands of competition and those worst case scenarios that come with competition. Yeah, and uh, you, you use a really good analogy that I'm sure a lot of um, uh, rugby players will understand uh, uh, so, about the you know your, your first the first time you drink and then the next time. Could, could you explain that? Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, well when you when you first when you first drink if you've never had a drink before in your life and you you're now legally able to drink you go out and you think you're going to have a big night um and you get you get one one beer down and you're going pretty well and you think this is going to be a great night and then by the next time you know you finish your second beer or you you don't even get through your second beer and you and you're drunk because you've got no beer tolerance um but over a period of time if you if you drink a little bit more you go out friday and saturday night and you you, you can slowly build your tolerance to beer. You can now, you can now drink six six beers, and by the end of the end of the night, you might be drunk, um, but you're nowhere near as hungover the next morning. Um, you don't feel as sick, um, and it's the exact same thing with training. That um, you need to you need to progressively build your tolerance to training. If you spike your training load above what you you've been accustomed, that's when you you increase your risk of injury. Uh, we've actually we're writing a, a little blog at the moment. I've never written a blog before, but we're uh, we're going to put a little um, our little um, beer load analogy out in a in a little in a little article that'll go online shortly. Um, and it we've collected a little bit of data um, from a conference, and we looked at beer load in terms of what what the acute load what what the um, attendees at the conference drank in one night compared to what they'd been prepared for over the last month. And we changed the the acute chronic workload ratio to the acute chronic alcohol ratio. And it's funny, when you when you spike your beer load above what you're used to, you, you tend to have a, a greater incidence of hangover symptoms, similar to what we find with training load. When you spike your training load more than what you're used to, you tend to increase your risk of injury. Yeah, so uh, obviously not condoning drinking there, but uh, um, no. so what, what are some kind of take-home tips you can uh, you can use then not to um, n- not to get in that situation where you're you're spiking a load? I think the the first thing to know to know with load or to understand with load is is um, load is a good thing. Um, load load doesn't have to necessarily be. Um, the vehicle that drives you towards injury. It actually can be the vehicle that drives you away from injury. And, and that's something that um, a lot of people don't realize is that when you, when you expose an athlete to load, um, you get physiological adaptations such as changes in aerobic fitness or changes in strength that actually protect against injury. When We know that when you have well-developed physical qualities such as aerobic fitness or, or strength, it actually allows you to to tolerate higher loads, and and what we're also starting to realise is that when you're when you have higher fitness, better developed physical qualities, it actually um, protects you against spikes in load. So there's some players that that can and can't handle spikes in load. It it seems that the fitter players, the stronger players, can handle those spikes a little bit better. They're more robust, a little bit more resilient. So so how do you get fit? You have to train. Uh, but in terms of monitoring training, um, one of the, the things that we we focus on is is one 
um, building building loads to high chronic loads. So we actually try and get our athletes to high chronic chronic training loads. But the the trick is how you get to those high chronic loads. If you spike your your loads up to a, a high load on the back of very low loads, you shouldn't be surprised to see that your your athletes break down. But if you can safely get them to high loads, it actually provides a protective effect against injury. And the, and the way that we – there's a couple of ways you can do that. One is you can make sure that you don't change your load, your workload from week to week any greater than 10%. As a rough guide, if you, if you work within that 10% framework, um, you should be pretty safe. Anything greater than 10%, we, we tend to see large spikes in injury risk. Probably the the better way that I would suggest you you look at it is through the the use of this acute to chronic workload ratio, and and basically the acute to chronic workload ratio it takes what you've done in the in in the current week, and we call that acute load, and we compare that to what you've done over the last four weeks, for example, which is your chronic load, and. If you ramp up your loads too quickly, so your acute to chronic workload ratio is quite high, so what that indicates is that your acute load is much greater than what you've been prepared for over the last four weeks, you increase your risk of injury. If if you have an acute to chronic workload ratio that's low, it means that you're well prepared and you shouldn't be in in a very fatigued state, so you should perform well. Um, The ratio, uh, what we have found is that when your ratio is 1.5, so what that means is what you've done in this week is one and a half times greater than what you've been prepared for over the last four weeks, that's when you increase the risk of injury. If you can keep your ratio somewhere between that 0.8 to 1.3, so you're, you're building fitness but you're not spiking loads, that's when you tend to be in a, a pretty safe training load range. So you're building fitness, but you're also keeping your athletes injury free. Yeah, and and Tim, it's this. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the same with um, with high speed running as well, isn't it? You, you've got to you've got to actually use it in your training to to prepare you for when you use it in competition. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Great question. Like this is a this is a big one because um, I, I just spoke to someone yesterday about this that. Um, their team that they were working with, they we don't do high speed running in training um, because they feel they feel they want to um, minimise the the risk of injury. Now they're they're right in a way, but but I also disagree with them in a way. So for example, we know that high speed running is a risk factor for soft tissue injuries, particularly hamstring injuries. If you if you do too much high speed running, it does increase your risk of hamstring injuries. But what we also know is that high-speed running, and particularly if we look at a test of high-speed running ability, prolonged high-intensity running ability, the athletes with better high-speed running ability tend to be protected against injury. They tend to survive matches injury-free for longer than those players who have poorer high-speed running ability. So even though high-speed running is predictive of injury, it's also protective against injury. Um, so it's sort of like a, I consider it like a vaccine against injury. Um, so one way to, to, to prevent some of these soft tissue injuries that come through high speed running is take the high speed running vaccine. You have to actually expose yourself to high speed running in order to protect yourself from high speed running injuries. Um, and, and the other thing that, to keep in mind is that there is a U-shaped curve between high-speed running and, and injury risk. So when you when you do high amounts or large amounts of high-speed running, it increases your injury risk. But equally, when you don't do enough high-speed running, it increases your risk of injury. So there's a U-shaped curve. Now, we've also looked a little deeper into that to say, well, what's the effect of high or low chronic loads on, um, on the back of these high-speed running risk? And if you can expose your athletes... If you expose your athletes to low chronic loads and then ask them to perform high speed running, the more high speed running they do, the greater their risk of injury. Now the flip side of this is if you do high chronic loads, you expose your athletes to high chronic workloads and then ask them to perform high speed running, 
on the back of high chronic workloads, they can actually achieve greater amounts of high speed running and the risk of injury is actually decreased. So high chronic loads are actually protective against high speed running injuries. Um, so there's two things. You have to expose your athletes to, to high speeds in order to be able to achieve them and in order to be protected against high speed running injuries. But high chronic loads actually allow you to perform those high speed running activities safely and, and you don't actually have to worry so much about injury. Yeah, that really highlights the importance of your, you know, your periodization, getting that, that base, that chronic load, and then progressing into more you know, high speed running. Um, yeah, Tim, at, at the conference, um, you spoke a bit about uh, a club you worked at that, you know, wasn't fortunate to have a, a big budget uh, to invest in, you know, the GPS units and all the monitoring tools. Um, I, I thought it'd be good for you to talk about that and, and give kind of our players an insight, for some of our players who don't have access to those monitoring tools, an insight into how you kind of used all the information that you've you've learned through all your research and then you applied it um, almost at a grassroots level. Yeah, look, I look, I look back on 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 that year, and it was um, it was a, a really challenging year. They, they 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 brought me on to do a particular role, and and part of it was to work as a as a sports science conditioning consultant. And uh, but they didn't have the you know the the technology that we've become accustomed to over the last ten years. And 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 part of that technology has been the staple of of sports science support. Uh, particularly in Australia for a long period of time. So in my head I was sort of going, well, geez, how am I going to do how am I going to do this role as effectively as I'd like? And then um, this calmness came over me where I actually went, you know, I I don't have to worry about that. I'll just go back to the way I used to do it before I had all the expensive technology. Um, and and part of that was through questionnaire based monitoring and and there's a whole heap of different types of questionnaires you can use and they were they were really just short sharp questionnaires no really big long questionnaires we'd we'd use session rpes pretty regularly and we we would use a five question um well-being questionnaire um but it really reinforced to me the importance of to getting to know my athletes getting to know my players um individually finding out what made them tick on an individual basis um, reading reading body language, looking in their eyes and seeing when their eyes were glazing over, or seeing when they were when they were looking pretty fresh and jumping out of their skin. So I, I had to I had to really go back to that that art of coaching that had been developed over a long period of time. And and to be honest with you, when I look when I look back at that, um, there wasn't a lot of um, sports science toys or, or large amounts of technology that that I used in that year, but I sort of feel like it was one of the the best sports science and, and strength and conditioning um, jobs that I, I was able to do um, because it it forced me to work out what was really important and and the things that I couldn't do without, and the thing that I couldn't do without was. Um, Getting to know my athlete, getting to know my player, and and working with them to get them better, um, and and sometimes I think we become a little dependent on the technology. We, we almost treat it like a bit of a crutch, but the important thing is that we shouldn't be we shouldn't be letting the numbers that come from a tech uh, a GPS unit or whatever else dictate how we coach. Um, so so don't we, we use it to help us, but don't don't use it as a crutch. We still got to coach the athlete, not the numbers. Yeah, it's it's another tool, isn't it? And it, it goes alongside, you know, actually talking to the player. You know, that's another form of data. Um, so you've got to take the whole the whole thing into the picture. Um, yeah, you, you've touched on it a bit um, in term of, in terms of you mentioned the aerobic capacity and strength, and um, you know, athletes who can produce uh, you know repeated high intensity efforts. But you've done some studies that sort of looking at. Uh, different testing batteries and then um, how those players have performed in games or in tackling technique tasks what what um, what, what important or what tests uh, are shown to be important for for rugby performance uh, look it, it, in general it, I mean there's it varies a little bit from um, from level to level but in in general we we have um, 
some some skill qualities obviously that are that are really important that discriminate you you good and your your not so good players uh, and definitely um, our one on one tackle assessment discriminates our first grade from our second grade players. We have a, a draw and pass assessment that also discriminates the the top level players from the next level down. And if you look at at uh, the number of tries that that get scored in rugby, probably fifty percent of tries that that are scored come from the last play being a draw and pass. So it's a pretty important skill to be able to do. Um, and you'd be surprised at at the number of the number of players who can't draw and pass. Um, and it's it's such a critical skill for the game. Um, from a physical point of view, there's a whole heap as well. So um, s- strength is particularly important. Lower body strength we've, we've shown to be really important um, in terms of um, recovery. So players who are, are stronger um, tend to recover quicker, but they also tend to perform more work in games, particularly repeated high-intensity effort bouts. And, and we know that repeated effort bouts are, are critical to the outcome of the game. They, you know, there, there is some research that we've done that has shown that, that 70% of tries scored or conceded come on the back of a repeat effort. So, you know, your ability to do those repeated efforts um, or your inability to do those repeated efforts, you know, is really critical. Um, we've, we've shown that um, things like um, upper body strength and prolonged high intensity running ability um, pr- provide a protective effect against injury. Um, so, and particularly contact injury, which is which is a kind of unique finding that you can you can actually train train athletes physically in the gym or, or on the park, and some of those qualities actually um, allow athletes to to stay injury free for longer. Um, and then there's a whole heap of other physical qualities like speed and, and body composition and aerobic fitness and, and the strength qualities that um, are particularly important for, from a selection point of view. And, and my take on this is that, you know, the conditioning guys may not be the ones sitting in the, around the selection table um, selecting the team to play each week, but by giving your players those physical qualities, by helping them develop those physical qualities, you actually put them in a position to compete for selection. So um, there's, a, there's a really important role that these physical qualities play um, for, for, across a, a wide range of um, areas in rugby, from selection to injury prevention to, to actually performance of game-specific skills and, and activity profiles. Yeah, definitely. The, the game seems to be getting faster and faster. So, you know, if you can develop those players who can perform at that level, or or more so than than their opposite their, their competition for the for the jersey, then the coaches are more often going to pick them. So, um, definitely have a, yep. a big hand in that. Tim, Tim, looking towards the kind of future of research in rugby, um, and it may be an opportunity if you talk about some of the research you're doing that, that might be new, but where do you sort of see it going? Do you, do you see any new developments or what, what's your next big thing that you want to sort of look into? Oh, gee, there, there's, always, um, there's always questions, just not enough time to answer them, um, Jamie. There's, um, look, I'll, I'll, um, I'll just keep plugging away at, uh, at a lot of the stuff I've been doing. You know, a lot of people have sort of um, looked at at the work I've been doing and saying, well, look, um, you're doing doing this workload and injury prevention um, stuff, you know, this research is really interesting. But I actually take a, a, a different view on it. Um, I actually don't look at it as workload and injury prevention. I look at it as, as workload and resilience or workload and robustness. Um, so a lot of the time, you know, we have to have a, uh, we have to have an outcome that, that is, you know, for a lot of, a lot of the stuff we've done has been injury, but you can flip that. The inverse of injury is is robustness, is sort of anti fragility, is someone who um, just seems no matter what you throw at them, they can handle it and they can handle a little bit more. And and that's that's what I'm really interested in is how how do we how do we um, devise training programs that's going to be able to even get that squeeze that little bit more of our out of our athletes, and it may be that we we don't have to train harder. Like just um, any any person can create fatigue, and and a good friend of mine, Adam Adam Beard, is a 
is a really good um, example of someone who who's told me this before. He said, you know, you could you can get your mother to create fatigue in a in a football player, but it's it's the the game specific fatigue that you need to elicit that's going to and the training that that you need to perform in order to um, achieve specific adaptation. Any person can create fatigue, but can they create um, an appropriate amount of fatigue that elicits the appropriate adaptation that you're after? Um, and and that's that's probably where I think um, you know we're, we're really interested in now is. Yes, we need to train hard. We know that high loads can can create um, resilience and robustness. Um, but what's what's the combination of loading? Does it mean that we just have to load more and more on the on the bar, or can we can we get stronger in other areas? Can we can we get stronger at, at lower levels, or can we um, become stronger along? A range of a different range of motion, a, a wider range of motion that that actually prevents some of the, you know, the pec tears or those sort of things that are happening. This so there's a whole heap of different different thoughts that I've had about, you know, the best way to to develop robustness in our athletes, and there's you know there's probably a lifetime of questions in that sort of stuff. I'd say. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and you touched on you know kind of people talking about injury prevention as a as opposed to how you like to call it resiliency. Do you, do you think in some ways people are kind of almost chasing the holy grail, trying to find that algorithm that predicts injury? Uh, yeah, my short answer is probably yes. <laughs> Look, I, I just, I, I'm a little bit more, um, wary, a little bit cautious of people who, who come in and say, "Look, um, we've got the algorithm that can can prevent can prevent injuries." Um, one is the the first reason for that is this, injuries are, are multifactorial. You know, we know that load is a big part of it, and and I would estimate probably out of the different sports that I work with, um, probably two thirds, around two thirds, probably more, maybe a little bit less at times, two thirds of injuries that occur have some sort of load related component. Um, so, you know, load has to factor in that model. Um, so when people come in and say, well, look, I can do, a, I can do this or I can do that, and with 97% accuracy, I can pre- predict 97% of your injuries, 97% of the time or whatever, um, I, I'm really cautious about those sort of numbers. Um, and and I, think, I think the first thing as a practitioner you need to do is ask yourself if it sounds too good to, to be true, then it probably is. Um, and what I, the second thing I say to, to people too is that I can actually reduce your injury rate to zero. I can make sure that this team never sustains another injury again. And and obviously the football manager, the rugby manager, the director of rugby gets really excited by that and they're, they're sitting forward on their seats going, well, how is he going to do this? And, and the answer is you never train and you never play. Um, and unfortunately, you, you'll never get another injury again but you'll also never experience all those intense highs and lows that come with with playing such a great game. Um, you know, so when you're in a sport like rugby, injuries are going to happen, um, and that's that's one thing that um, uh, both players and and staff and administrators who are involved in the sport they have to accept that. Um, I think probably if if we take a step back from algorithms, we can we can actually get a, a much better outcome for our players if we have every person involved in the training process, um, from the player, through the physio, through the conditioning staff, through to the skill coaches, through the DOR, and maybe even administrators if they're involved in some way, um, if they're on the same page and they're talking to each other and they're working together, that's that's going to probably bring about um, a better reduction in injuries than any algorithm. Yeah, and, and what I think, and to your credit, uh, what you do is is you you find information that you can like you've built the principles of the, you know the chronic acute that people can start applying, and and you also explain it very, you know, your you know first drink analogy. You you, <laughs> you do it in ways that it's easy for us to then go to rugby players and explain it so they understand it and that you know that builds that that discussion um with everyone in the club and and that's as you say a huge thing to to 
reducing injuries. I think one of the other speakers at the conference in commentary said you can never prevent injuries, you, you can only sort of reduce the incidents. Um, so, uh, as I said, you're, you're at the, the forefront of research in rugby. Um, so for, for any of our listeners who might be interested in uh, in, in more research, obviously we'd, we'd suggest looking at your stuff, but I'm, I'm sure you'd be aware of other people in the um, in the area. Who, who would you recommend to, to look into? What's, what sort of work and papers? Um, oh, look, there's there's a lot of a lot of really good people um, doing doing rugby research. Uh, you know, I look at um, in New Zealand, New Zealand, uh, you know, the All Blacks have been such a dominant force in international rugby for such a long period of time. So I, I like looking at well, who who's who's involved in those programs and the sports science and the conditioning guys um, in those programs are. Are as good as you'll find. Mike Anthony and Nick Gill uh, are terrific, but also Ken Quarry. You know, the the three of those guys um, I know pretty well, and um, and the thing I like about them is they've achieved a, a great amount of success. But they're um, extremely humble pe- people. All three of them, they're, they're terrific people. Uh, but I think they do great work. Um, you know, in in the UK, I, I think um, Craig Twist has a really good understanding of of rugby. You know, when I talk to Craig, um, I think his I think his research is is terrific. But I also think he he just he gets the game, he gets the people, and a lot of people um, work in work in rugby or work in rugby league, and they they actually don't understand the people and um, part and and the game part of. Part of being able to, to do research in a, in a sport, in a particular sport, rugby is a good example, but you could use football as an example as well, is, is that they, they have their particular culture and, and there's a certain type of person, if you like. And when you, when you understand that, it makes, it makes the, uh, the research really quite easy and a, and a lot of fun because you, you know, you're interacting with them on their level. They, they know that you get it. Um, so I think Craig does a good job with that. There's a whole whole heap of other um, uh, yeah, different people that I've sort of come across, and I, you know, I feel like I'd probably, um, you know, I feel like I've probably already um, named named people, and then I'm, I know I'll miss a whole heap of people. I'll get off the, the the call now, and I'll for sure I'll think, oh, I should have said this person, I should have said this person. But there's a there's a whole heap of people um, that I've met, particularly in the last couple of years, where I go, these are these are great practitioners. Um, but they they're also really humble about the way they they go about their business you know they, they could be working with the biggest teams in the world but they're they're very down to earth people um, they they question a lot they they're always looking to get better um, so you know and and I've met so many people from so many different countries um, I, I couldn't possibly list them all yeah well so, sorry you put you in that situation to, to no, that's right. <laughs> Um so Tim, just finally, um, where can people learn more about yourself? And I, I know you've got a couple of workshops uh, in the UK sort of coming up. Do you want to talk about those? Yeah, look, the workshops, uh, you know, people ask, well, what, why are you doing the workshop? Well, um, part, one of the big reasons is there's there's so much, um, so many scientific papers out there on on either rugby research or the workloads and injury um, stuff that we've done. But the way we have to write them, for scientific journals, um, as you expect, is in a really scientific manner, um, and and for the most part, those papers are, are really hard to get through for for um, coaches. Coaches could benefit a lot from the information, but there's just so you know so many the, the language, the scientific language is really it's a bit of a slog to read. Um, so um, and and same with with medical staff and conditioning staff. Um, they read it, but the amount of time that they get to actually um, sit down and, and read a paper, we can deliver a, an entire workshop in that time. But the difference is, you know, hopefully as you as you can see, is I I write a heap differently from the way I speak. Um, so I can use some some analogies and I can um, just use some examples and we can use some video and and show. You know, this is what it actually looks like. This is what this drill looks like, rather than trying to describe it in a whole heap of scientific language. Um, so we're we're trying to we're trying to make research as user friendly and as as accessible to the practitioner. And it's it is real world research. So, we, but we're just trying to make it um, so that 
it gets out to the people who can use it the most. Um, so that's the whole idea of the the workshops that we do. Um, you know, and we're doing them all around the world now, so it's it's a lot of fun getting out to a lot of different teams. Oh, that's awesome. And have you got any dates set in the in the UK? Uh, yeah, look, um, I'll be in um, I'll be in the UK. It's a, it's a pretty busy couple of months. September the second through the ninth of September, and then in October I'll be there roughly from um, the the twenty third of October through to about the the ninth of November. So um, you know, if any teams are interested in this in this sort of area, um, they can always get in contact with me, and and even if they've if um, you know, if they're interested in the workshops, feel free to contact me. But even if they're not interested in the workshops and they and just have a question, you know, I'm always, I'm not, I'm not super quick on emails, but I'm, I'm I promise, I promise you all that I'll get back to you. Um, you know, I do, I do respond to the questions, and because, you know, it it helps me as well to to find out what the real challenges are that you're facing. Yeah, that's great, and and we'll uh, we'll put a link to your website um, in in the show notes so people can uh, can click across. And have a look and, and get in touch, Tim. Yep. Uh, thanks very much. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I'm sure our listeners have got a you know a huge amount of uh, information out of that and and practical things they can apply to their their training and programming. Um, thanks very much, uh, and all the best. Thanks, Jamie. All the best for training. <laughs> Cheers. See you, mate. So there you go, another great podcast, and we'd like to thank Tim for taking the time to share his knowledge with us and and our listeners, um, and some really good take home tips there for how to. Um, affect your training to prevent injury and improve performance for rugby if you're still uh, none the wiser then check out our online membership subscription program Um, best way to get in shape for rugby currently going through the pre-season and uh, we're offering a free nutrition ebook on sign up at the moment so uh, check that out Uh, and of course check us out on social media facebook twitter instagram and in the meantime just look keep a look out for more podcasts coming um and subscribe to us on itunes soundcloud stitcher uh and any other podcast uh, providers you use and give us a, a good review and we'll keep these coming all the best thanks for listening to the rugby renegade podcast for more quality rugby strength and conditioning information check us out at rugbyrenegade.com rugby renegade building machines